Space viruses, AI taking over YouTube, and the ISS has a broken toilet? Yikes. All that and more on today's lightning round video. Hello and welcome to this month's lightning round video. Lightning round videos, if you don't know, are where I take questions from my Patreon people who support at the solar system level. That's the perk, one of the perks of the solar system level. You get to ask questions. I answer them in a lightning round video. And what I do is I come in completely unprepared, like a professional. Now, I haven't seen any of these questions beforehand, so these are all, these are all real. This is the real stuff that I do. This is where I get real with you people. Real unprepared. So let's see how I do this. So these are meant to be fun, relaxing, chill. I didn't even bother to fix my hair. Not that you can tell. Anyway, sit back, enjoy, grab a beverage, and let's get into this. All right, we got a question from Brian Beswick. He asked, recently the International Space Station's urine filtration system broke. Oh no, I didn't hear about this. Uh, is the space station getting too old and are there succession plans for it? Also, what's your best joke about broken space toilets? Well, put me on the spot with a joke there. Uh, so I haven't heard about the, the urine filtration system breaking, but I know that that's one of many things that are starting to kind of show its age on the ISS. Yeah, I don't remember how long it was supposed to originally last, but I feel like it's it's lasted longer than anybody expected. It's It's been up there a while. As for succession plans, I mean, I've done videos about this before, about private space stations. Um, NASA seems to basically be seeding at this point low Earth orbit to private companies, basically. They're focusing on the moon, going out into deeper space, uh, exploration, vision, that kind of thing. So there's the Axiom space uh, station that I keep hearing things about that they're uh, in the works. That one is actually going to be built on the station, on the International Space Station, and then eventually kind of separate out and do its own thing. There's Orbital Reef with Blue Origin and Sierra Space. Uh, I've done a video on that. Um, I know that pretty soon, hopefully by the end of this year, we're gonna see the, the Dream Chaser go up for the first time. That's kind of a big component of Orbital Reef in terms of like getting people and cargo back and forth. In fact, I, you know, I could go down the list of all the private space stations, but I've already done a video on it. So let's just link it right here. Somewhere, it should pop up depending on where you're, yeah. I know also like when they do eventually retire the ISS, they're going to have to bring it down and um, that's going to be the most spectacular re-entry burn, I guess, that we've ever seen. It's, it's the largest thing that's ever been put into space. Um, I know that when Skylab came down, some things went wrong it actually wound up landing somewhere in Australia and it was, it was a big deal, but it was like, at the time it was the biggest thing that had ever come down and it was a very small space station compared to the ISS. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of, kind of doubt that the ISS is going to last another 10 years. Uh, the Chinese already have their own space station up there and there's, like I said, multiple private space stations on the way. So, um, it's probably coming to the end of its, of its life. Although, we thought that maybe 10 years ago, so we'll see. And my best joke about space toilets, I don't know, something about um, this is why we can't go to Uranus. It, it's easy to go straight to Uranus when you're making a scatological space joke. I stand by it. All right, next question. Mark Hoffman wrote, do you think trains could be plausible as a post-apocalyptic survival method? Oh. Uh, we have some Snowpiercer vibes here. Okay, so, um, Snowpiercer is immediately what I'm going to, this has to be a reference to Snowpiercer. Um, the movie, fantastic. The TV show, I've seen the first season of it. I've never, actually, no, I've seen the first and second season of it. I need to watch the rest of it because I have a friend who's on it. Hi, Lena. Hi. I know it all just got released out of, I believe, Hulu, so that's, that's on my agenda now. So I love, I love both of those, uh, uh the, the movie and the TV show. Uh, I think it's it's a it's a cool concept. I don't I don't understand the feasibility of it though. To be honest, I've always wondered like what's the point of a of a train constantly circling the globe? Like how is that the best way to preserve humanity? I'm sure it's explained somewhere. Somebody could explain it in the comments. I did like in the in the I don't know if it was in the movie, but in the show like a, a form of punishment, sort of like. Uh, you know, back in the in the old days, if you stole something, they would hack off your hand kind of thing. Uh, in this one, they would just make you stick your hand out the window and it was so cold outside that your hand would, would freeze off. That was a punishment, was to stick your hand out of a, like a porthole. Brutal, but neat. 
I mean, the whole thing about um, Snowpiercer as a concept was more about like class divisions in society because you had like the first class. Like, you, it's very easy to take a train as a metaphor for society as a whole. You know, you got first class and second class and then stowage and, you know, people down at the bottom. And the people at the bottom, you know, revolt and want to take over. So that's just kind of what happens in, in the world. So metaphorically, I think it's, it's fantastic. Uh, as an actual post-apocalyptic survival method, <laughs> I don't get it. Honestly, I don't get it. Because someone has to maintain the tracks. Tracks don't just sit there forever. Somewhere out there watching this is, 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 a, is, a, is a track inspector or something. that like That's their job is to maintain thousands of miles of tracks. And it's a lot of work. And it's something nobody thinks about. And they are completely underappreciated for what they do for the infrastructure of this country. And they probably watch Snowpiercer and are like, okay, who's who's fixing the tracks? Especially if it's like covered in ice and there's always gonna be like ice forming on it. I mean, yeah. So I am pro train, but I'm not sure it, it's it's better than like a, a bunker or something like that. Although it might be the best way to get from one bunker to another in a post-apocalyptic society, anyway. All right, next up we got Fishtail who asks, with legitimate content creators needing to create sensational thumbnails, how do you spot AI generated, uh, meaning no effort, money grab, YouTube videos? Oh boy. Am I about to throw a shade? I feel like I'm about to throw some shade. Okay, so before I start answering this question and probably ruffling some feathers, I should make clear I have definitely used AI to make thumbnails before. Um, through mid journey, that kind of thing. But also, especially now that, um, there's so many AI tools in Photoshop itself, I use that a lot now. So I say that to say that like, just because somebody uses an obvious AI image in their thumbnail doesn't necessarily mean that it's low effort content. Um, one channel that I will, I, I don't mean to call this out. I've never met this guy, but uh, Thoughty2, who's been around forever. I actually really like his videos quite a bit, but he's been using AI in his thumbnails a lot um, in the last year or so. So the reason I point that out is not to like throw shade at him. I like his videos. I'm just saying like um, it's not necessarily going to be a low effort video just because they use AI in their thumbnails. Quick detour from this question, just because this is something that I, I just happened, or I just saw this yesterday. Uh, many of you may know the the YouTuber, uh, Rick Beato, the music YouTuber. He did a video, uh, I just saw it yesterday, it, it's fairly recent, I don't know if it just came out or not. By the way, I'm recording this early, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, go check out his channel. Uh, he did a video about AI music. He's talked about it quite a bit, actually. And he was telling a story about how his kids, who I guess are, you know, kind of teenage years, um, were able to spot AI music way better than he could. Like he was kind of being blown away. People were sending him some some examples of AI music that sounds, even with voices and everything, it sounds real. And um, and to him, he was kind of like, wow, this is getting pretty crazy. I can't tell the difference. But his kids just immediately were like, why are you listening to AI music? So he was kind of blown away by that sort of, I guess, generational divide that his kids could pick up on it faster than he could. Uh, now that's music, not AI images. I don't know, just for some reason that uh, I found that that interesting. That was an interesting video, by the way. But getting back to your question in terms of like how I how I determine what is a low effort, like AI driven uh, kind of video content, money grab type content, I guess I look less at the image itself and whether or not that image was generated with AI. And I look more at like the title and the, I guess, clickbaitiness of it all. There, there's a whole bunch of videos that come across my, my feed that are uh, just making claims that just can't possibly be true. There, there was a whole thing for a while. Maybe it's calmed down a little bit. Maybe my, maybe my algorithm has, has shifted a little or something. But I used to get these literally every time I opened up YouTube. It was something where they would make this ridiculous uh, statement that couldn't possibly be true. And I wind up wanting to click on it just to be like, are they really actually saying this? Because there's no way they're actually saying this. I don't know what to call it other than you've got to be kidding me bait. <laughs> you know, it's like they have to be lying bait. Like you want to watch it just to be, just to see how much they're lying and how mad you're going to be at this thing. I had to work against my natural impulse to not click on these things and give them a view. For examples of that, I mean, there were, I mean, there's a lot of Elon stuff in there where, where they like say Elon invented a warp drive. 
My favorite, I've mentioned this one before, is one of them claimed that Elon built the pyramids. It's just ridiculous, ridiculous stuff. A lot of them have this sort of templated background where it's like Elon or the president of NVIDIA, who I see a lot, or uh, Tim Cook from Apple, some big tech bro that uh, is standing on a stage and doing this and there's something on the, the screen behind them that's the point of the video. I feel like that's even less work than like finding a good prompt for an AI image and then putting it into the right format for a, for a thumbnail and everything. It's literally just a template with a guy and a stage and you just throw a picture on there. And I know that some people do that with uh, shorts. They kind of just have completely AI driven shorts where AI writes the content, there's an AI voice that delivers the content, uh, and it's just like random AI images that play on top of it. I think that's just like the spaghetti at the wall approach. Just if you if you make a thousand of them a day and just pump them out there, eventually something is gonna catch on uh, enough to, to make the channel grow. But yeah, I mean just to just to put a bow on it, like again with with me when I'm watching YouTube, it's it's that it's that super lazy templated guy on stage pointing at something in a statement in the title that can't possibly be true or is just like you know finally happened that kind of stuff um and these things go through trends by the way like some they'll, they'll you'll be see like finally happened was a thing for like m like a, a couple of years there like just constantly everywhere you looked finally happened you know they found a wormhole in space and aliens are coming through so, uh, whatever that's a signal to me that it's low rent engagement bait and there's nothing really substantive to it. There you go. All right, next up we have Rafe, Rafe or Rafe? I'm gonna say Rafe, Rafe Zero Humor Singer, who asked, why was the mole of oxygen molecules excited when he walked out of the singles bar? Answer, he got Avogadro's number. Really? <laughs> Nerd humor. Anyway, why is the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere more important than the percentage of oxygen volume for keeping you warm and mobile? Oh, good lord. I'm gonna have to pull this one out of my butt. So you guys know, um, very, very late in life, I discovered that pressure changes everything. I really need to get that on a t-shirt, just pressure changes everything. Cause like, that's, that was like such a re revelation to me when I, when I figured that out. Or when it finally sunk in, let's say, I'm sure I was, taught that a million times and I just never quite picked up on it. So to answer this question to the best of my ability, um, I imagine that the pressure matters because it's the pressure that forces it into your lungs so that you can breathe. Without that, you would need some kind of a tube or iron lung or something to, to make the, the air go in and out. So for example, when, uh, when the astronauts, uh, especially in the early days of the, the program, it was a full oxygen environment, the, the pressure was actually really low. It was a very low pressure that they were in. Um, partly because it was just easier on equipment and everything and seals and whatnot. But since it was a pure oxygen environment, they didn't have to have it really high pressure because the, the oxygen was making its way in. So I guess the, the lower the percentage of oxygen as part of the air mixture, um, the more pressure you need to make sure that it, that it gets in there. You guys tell me if I got that right. Like I said, I just, I just pulled that out of my butt. So uh, that's what I'm thinking. You guys tell me in the comments below how off I am. So I got one more question to get to, but before we do that, I want to give a big shout out to all the new channel members and Patreon members who have signed up recently and let them be praised by the glorious Zoe. We've got Brian Schwartz, W. Pringle, Patrick Nolan, Shyla Blevins, Jeff King, Nate Lucas, Liliandra, Quana Dykes, Fagan, Wee Wee Plays, <laughs> James J.C. Kelly, Alloy Apples, those are new Patreon members, and new channel members include Catherine Harper, Starboy, Steve Hawkins, Max Randolph, Barge Saika, Diego Lopez, Dale Snyder, Kiwi, Tim McCarroll, and Deckard686. Thank you guys so much. You keep the lights on around here. And also, you guys are just forming an awesome community. I'm seeing lots of exchanges between people on our Discord, which is also available just for Patreon members and uh, channel members and stuff. Um, Really appreciate all of you guys, and I appreciate the, the great connections and relationships I'm seeing come up in the community. It's really awesome. All right, now we got a question from Donna Sawyer, who asked, There are studies that have shown that bacteria and viruses have been to space, that have been to space, return more potent without having their genetics altered. Interesting. Uh, what are the impacts from the commercialization of space travel if bacteria starts coming back more virulent? Huh. 
These have been some good questions today because I, uh, I've, I, like, there's a couple of things here that I didn't really know about. I've, I've heard about bacteria and viruses uh, going to space and coming back and surviving. I didn't know necessarily that they were more potent, though. So I decided to look it up, and in our typical, you know, oversaturation of media environment, there's like all these conflicting headlines here where it's like, bacteria get dangerously weird in space, bacteria grown in space become more deadly, and then come down here, uh, bacteria on the International Space Station no more dangerous than other similar strains, and down here, bacteria on the International Space Station no more dangerous. So. Uh, it sounds like something that came out in maybe like, I see some of these in 2007 and then in 2017 and then now in more recent ones, they're kind of like, nah, it's really not that bad. So like, for example, the top uh, Google link was from the uh, advertising delivery program that masquerades as space journalism, space.com, um, that uh, like this, it has, they have room for the headline and that's about it on the top of the page, whatever. So they talk about how in 2009 they found uh, samples of Bucholderia cepacea and Bucholderia contaminans <laughs> that are bacteria that they found in the, the water dispenser and drinking water on the space station. So that was back in 2009, but in some of the studies that have happened from 2010 to 2014, they found that um, uh, they found that the bacteria living on the space station were no more dangerous than similar microbes on Earth. And if an astronaut were to get a bacterial infection from these microbes, uh, it'd be treatable with antibiotics. So this was released in a PLOS One article in 2020. So at the bottom of their abstract it reads, Overall, we find that while the populations of Bacolderia present in the ISS PWS each maintain virulence, they are likely to not be more virulent than those that might be encountered on the planet and remain susceptible to clinically used antibiotics. So when I first read this question, my first thought was that it was kind of like the way we get superbugs here on Earth, where uh, maybe up in space, well, originally I was thinking that it was outside the space station or something, but that maybe up in space, like the, the weak bacteria get kind of killed off so that the stronger bacteria um, thrive and get a little bit more virulent. But I mean, yeah, it, it looks like it, it might have all been a bit of a uh, early warning too early. An internet myth, if you will. Uh, just to be fair and play a little bit of devil's advocate, I did look up uh, one of the articles from 2007 where they were talking about this, and they were talking about something different. They were actually talking about um, uh, Streptococcus, I believe? No, oh, Salmonella. They had, a, they had a Salmonella thing on the Spatial Atlantis at one point. So yeah, according to this, they, they did a, an experiment where they had a, a salmonella outbreak, small salmonella outbreak on Atlantis, and then when they brought them back, they tested them out on mice, and the mice got sicker, uh, worse, and faster than they would with earthbound bacteria. But they do make the point in here that astronauts uh, says that they face a, a double threat because your immune system does take a little bit of a hit when you're in zero gravity. Um, just a lot of things in your body work differently with no, you know, force pushing everything down. Um, so if it's possible that salmonella does get a little bit more virulent in space and you also have a weaker immune system, you know, there's a little bit of a extra threat there. So yeah, those may be talking about two different things, but I think it's, it's a, it's a valid question. Um, space stations, the space environment, they're very closed off. They're very insular. Uh, I imagine that it's going to create different uh, pathological issues around by our bacteria and stuff like that. So in terms of like the impact of especially commercial space travel, I think, you know, there might just need to be some different protocols involved. Um, you know, a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the COVID protocols that we've been following uh, for the last few years, uh, it might be something like that uh, in terms of like just making sure you get tested and, and, and whatnot. So um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that much of a danger. It just might be an adjustment, put it that way. That's my take on it. All right, I want to thank everybody who has submitted questions to this. Hopefully I did a good enough job of answering them or at least being entertaining while I flop around trying to sound coherent. If you've never seen this channel before, somehow this came across your algorithm and your front page or whatever, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. They're a lot more structured than this. I'll be back with another video next Monday, but in the meantime, you guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.